A lot of people describe jujitsu as like human chess. I remember I stepped into this MMA gym and there was actually a professional UFC fighter. I remember I got paired with him and basically it was a very, um, not only with uh, this professional fighter, but what would happen is um, I would even go with people that were smaller than me and I started to see that they were utilizing techniques that would strategically tire me out. And I saw how methodical, how strategic it was. And I realized that this is something that I wanted to learn. Hi, my name is Mikey Minimo. I currently function as a chaplain and a part-time jiu-jitsu coach here at the Ohana Jiu-Jitsu Club. Got into jiu-jitsu uh, around, my goodness, almost 13 years ago. When you first start jujitsu, you will get in shape like really, really fast because you're using your whole body, using all your muscles. And what happens is as time goes on, you become very, very efficient to the point where sometimes it's difficult to get a good workout. But one thing I really do adore is that it encourages, maybe forces you to become more resilient, not to give up. It's really interesting too, in jujitsu, um, it's one of those martial arts that the, the promotion level, it's, it's not fast. You know, there are some martial arts, man, you can get your black belt in like three years. It's like, no, the average black belt in jujitsu is 10 years, 10 years. I mean, that's like more than a PhD, you know? And me, I've been doing it for 13 years. I'm still a brown belt. There's a saying in jujitsu that the, the, mat, the mats don't lie, right? So somebody can come in here who has never experienced jujitsu and put on a black belt. Um, the truth is that people will know. People will know right away. Um, one of those things that I, I dare to say, even impossible to, to mimic or fake. In jujitsu, as taxing as it is on the body, I do kind of find peace, almost like in that middle of that storm. There are so many times in jujitsu where you're gonna experience failure. But the, the concept that, the, the mindset that you start to develop is that there's no losing, it's only learning. Sometimes the best way to learn the material is to teach it. And at first it would start with me teaching my son jujitsu. An offer was made and it started with me teaching like a kids program um, and then transitioning into adults and then now it's something I like do part time. I like to invest into people and empower them too as well. You'll see a lot of people that come in, they're not very confident, you know, um, and soon after a year, you, you start to see that they physically start to change and their demeanor, everything is, it changes. Um, and it's, it's amazing to see. People can walk into a room and be confident. I think every time I go to even when I'm being apprenticed, I go to different instructors and I'm under them. A little bit of their game, a little bit of them becomes a part of mine. I've learned um, that it's not all about gifts. There are some people that are naturally talented. A lot of it, more of it is actually hard work. It's grit, heart is the biggest thing um, and never giving up. Every day you, you, come, you come into the academy and you're being reprogrammed and to face adversity. I'm a hospice chaplain by profession. And you can imagine that, um, the, especially in that end of life care, where my, a lot of my patients, they're about to pass away. Every once in a while, I'll have this conversation and I say, hey, is there any advice that you have for me? You know, um, something that, uh, you know, you, you've, you've learned through life. And when I'm, when I'm there at the end of life, we're not talking about the state of debt or what happens to you like when you die. No, it's like, it's about relationships. You know, um, spending more time with your kids, uh, spending time with family. I guess I, I'm seeing what the most important things are. That's why I, I try to involve also my kids in what I do. You know, with my son, Meek, um, I, I want to invest into him. My, my prayer is for them to be a blessing to this world.
I sat with several thousand other pastors listening to someone who was quite well known as a pastor and a preacher speak to us. He was talking with us about the realities of pastor life, but in a special way about the preaching ministry. It's kind of that experience that in any field, you might go, if you're a member of that field, to hear someone who's way down the road ahead of you and has learned some things and has become particularly good at sharing those. So we were gathered there hoping to learn, hoping to grow. And he shared with us something that lodged itself in my mind, something that I've not forgotten. don't remember the rest of all that he said, but I do remember this. Speaking to preachers, this seasoned preacher said, over the years I have become convinced that the people to whom we preach week in and week out, he's talking to several thousand of us, the people to whom we preach week in and week out are terrified by one thought. Well, with a statement like that, obviously he had our attention. He said, I, I've come to believe that people are terrified by this thought. This is as good as it's going to get that they sit there and think about their life, think about the things that they had hoped for and dreamed for, things that aren't going so well, places where they had failed, and that, that they're terrified, he said, by thinking, I don't think it's going to get any better. I don't know if that's true, only you could say. But it has left me wondering about a couple who comes in and sits down for worship, terrified by the thought, this is as good as our marriage is going to get. It's not going to improve beyond this. This is our reality. Or by the person a third of the way through a professional career thinking, I've already hit the peak. There's no more advancement. Everything from here on out is downhill. Or the person who sits and says, will I never be rid of this anxiety that just hounds my emotional life? I'm so sick and tired of feeling anxious. Will I still feel this in a year, in five years, in 20 years? Or is this as good as it's going to get? Or maybe somebody here getting ready for church this morning. You walk by the mirror and took a look and said, oh my goodness, I've got to do something. I got to get rid of that mirror is what I got to do. <laughs> this is as good as it's going to get. I've wondered, is that preacher right? Are we fearful of that? But you know, as I've thought about it, I've thought there is something at the core of that that's good and that we ought to take note of. And that is this. If we are fearful that this is as good as it's going to get, this is the high as we're going to reach, that points to a desire, even, even a yearning within us for life transformation. We're not happy with where it is. We want it to get better. Maybe we want to become a more mature person, a more loving person, a more peace-loving couple or family. Maybe we want to grow in our intellectual arenas or, or emotional arenas in other areas of our life. Maybe if that fear is there, part of it is driven by a desire for life transformation, and that's a good thing. So two weeks ago, we went to a passage in the gospel where Jesus, walking along the seaside, just said to four fishermen, come, follow me. We noted that Jesus calls us on our ordinary days. And when he calls us to follow him, our question immediately is, well, where are we going? You remember our answer. The destination is life transformation and unknown destinations. So the last four parts of this series, beginning last week, are about that question of life transformation. How does that happen? What's involved in being formed in new and different ways in Christ? So today we go looking for an answer to that, to Paul's writings, not to the Gospels where we've been, but this time to Romans, Romans chapter 12, to Paul's writings. Now, if we're going to understand in the best way, what Paul says in this brief passage. We need to understand a bit about the context. 
So remember that for the first 11 chapters of Romans, starting here with chapter 1 and going all the way over here to the end of chapter 11, Paul has been focused on the faithfulness of God and the fact that the faithfulness of God has sought out a broken world and has drawn us to himself. Even when we were enemies, Paul says, Christ died for us. That's the degree of his mercy on our behalf. There's nothing we can do to earn it. It's given to us as a free gift. That's the mercy of God. In a sense, what Paul is covering in those 11 chapters is in some ways summarized and contained in the call of Jesus, come, follow me. But now we come to chapter 12. At chapter 12, we turn a corner. At chapter 12, Paul is now going to begin talking about the life transformation that happens for us and for the community of Christ's disciples as we follow him. So that's where we step down today. Now, just two or three items before we read the passage. First one is, just this past week, I read in a commentary a scholar who said, I don't know of a passage in the Bible, certainly not in the New Testament, this brief that is more pregnant with theological terms and theological meaning. This is indeed a pregnant passage. Because of that, we're going to have to be careful what we bite off. So as we read it, I want you to pay attention to two words, conform and transform, confirmation, transformation. Those are contained in the first sentence of verse 2. We're only reading two verses. And then finally, we're going to read it first of all in the NIV, from which we often read, usually read, But then I want to read it to you in Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, The Message. Peterson had a gift for putting it into accessible language. So let's read Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore, what's that therefore? Therefore, it's there because he's saying in light of all of this, these 11 chapters of talking about the faithfulness of God and the call on your life, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, that's the first 11 chapters, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Now that sentence in verse 2. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So Paul is talking to us about a fork in the road. One option leads in the direction of conformation, not confirmation, but being conformed. The other leads in the direction of being transformed. While you're thinking about that fork in the road, though, listen to how Eugene Peterson rendered it in the message. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. That's the conform part. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. That's the transform part. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Friends, we are being formed every day. So what do we mean by that term, formed? It means that countless influences around us are urging us in directions that form us more and more like them. We slowly are changed. We slowly are transformed. We notice it outwardly, physically, in kids. I just said it to someone I greeted this morning coming into church. I looked at her and I said, I knew someone that looked just like you except she was about this tall. What happened to you? Suddenly growing up, we are being formed in different ways The question is, are we being conformed or transformed? 
There are three realities I think we need to note and we need to remember that grow out of this passage and the lives in which we live. The first one is simply this, that something or someone is forming us, is forming us. Something or someone is forming us. If we take what Paul says here, he is saying there are two primary possibilities. The first one is the word, and the second one is the age. Because if you look at the original Greek, when he says, do not conform to this world, the original Greek, the word is not cosmos, not the world, the globe, the planet. It's ion. It refers to the age. Do not be conformed to the age in which you live. Every age has its belief systems, its truths, its things that it tries to push out to every person in that cultural age. You know what some of the beliefs in our culture are? They're things like you're only as good as what you do. You're worth only as much as your bank says you are. You're only as popular as you look. You've only succeeded depending on your address, your model of car, what your bank account says. That's what many times are the cultural messages that come at us in this age. If we subscribe to those messages, they will form us. And as they form us, we will become the most anxiety-ridden, angry people with feelings of inferiority that jump from relationship to relationship trying to be valuable. We have allowed the age to form us. Now, I didn't bring it up here because I don't ever bring it into church, and so I forgot to bring it. But I want to tell you this. While I've been pastoring here at this church, I had a friend who came to see me one day. He said, I want to show you something. I said, okay. He pulled something out of his pocket and showed it to me. I said, I have no idea. What, what, what is this? And he was trying to describe it to me, and I, d I didn't quite get it. I said, what's it called? He says, it's called an iPod. <laughs> iPod. That's while I've been here. I will tell you, I and many of you have had a ringside seat to the most dramatic, transformative reality that currently forms more people at more profound levels than I, I would argue than anything else in our world. It's profoundly formative. And not entirely, but for the most part, it is not forming us in the Word. It's forming us to the age. Read to you from John Mark Comer. I know, I know. Uh, I promise you, just this quote. Now, I make no promises about next week, but today. John Mark Comer, we join him in mid-sentence, talking about our phones and social media, etc. Here's what he writes. Tish Harrison Warren says, None of us comes to what we believe by ourselves. The world has no free thinkers. Think about that for a moment. The world has no free thinkers, she says, and he's quoting her. You're going to think he sounds like a conspiracy theorist. But if you read the research, you'll decide he's not so conspiracy theorist. Listen to what he continues to say. Powerful voices have a vested interest in our believing the myth, and it is a myth, that we are following no one at all. Many of the cultural liturgies that indoctrinate us daily, be true to yourself, you do you, speak your truth, can be traced back to sources with a nefarious agenda. If they, whether multinational corporations, politicians, anti-democratic government agents, marketing departments, influencers who just want more followers, etc., etc., can make us believe that each person is a blank slate just following the inner compass of our authentic self in an up upward march to happiness, they can keep us blind to all the ways we've been discipled, formed and manipulated by their desires. Now, this isn't trying to throw shade on social media or phones exclusively. It is simply trying to say, pay attention to where you are being formed and by whom you're being formed. Continuing with Comer. 
Any skilled con artist knows that the key to deceiving your mark is to get them, your target, to believe your scheme was their idea. Translation, the key to getting people to follow you is to convince them they aren't following anyone at all. With the rise of social media empires and their spooky digital algorithms, these powerful forces now have direct access to our flows of consciousness every time we slide our thumbs across our phones. What we are led to believe are just ads, news links, retweets, and random digital flotsam are in reality mass behavior modification techniques intentionally designed to influence how we think, feel, believe, shop, vote, and live. To quote the tech philosopher Jaron Lanier, what might once have been called advertising must now be understood as continuous behavior modification on a titanic scale. The world, or the age as it's called in the New Testament, is forming us constantly. It's tough. The argument can legitimately be made. We cannot live in today's world without our devices. It's just the way life happens. They bring many good things to us. But just be aware, we are being formed by someone or something who isn't. So here's a clue that has been helpful to me. If you want to understand who is forming me, this is what I would say. Who has your eyes, who has your ears, has your heart. Who has your eyes, who has your ears, has your heart. And whoever or whatever has your heart is forming you, no matter what other claim you make or I make. So who has pride of place? with my eyes, pride of place, with my ears. That is what or who has my heart. And who has my heart forms me. So Paul gives us a nod saying something or someone is doing it. Is it the word or is it the age? But there's a second reality involved here. Certain actions are forming us. Certain actions are forming us. Certain ways that we live are forming us. If we read thoughtfully what Paul says, there are two kinds of actions. One is actions by choice. The other is actions by chance. If we live our lives by chance... Just taking it as it comes, just doing what we need to do to survive, just getting by, just going home. I have done this. I've gotten home from a hard day at work, tired, good day, but very tiring. Think, I don't have any energy. I'll just kind of scroll through YouTube, through some things here, sit there and scroll, seeing this, that, and the other, and then look at my watch and say, what happened to the last hour and a half? Where did it go? And why am I now in a bad mood? Why do I suddenly feel inadequate? Why am I angry about the news that I saw, anxious about how everyone else is doing, scared because of what? And I say, what just happened? If we live our lives by chance, that can be exactly where we end up. On the other hand, if the actions in which we engage are by choice, they will lead us in a very different direction. But the truth is that both of these are formative. There is a circular relationship. We act in a certain way and feel another way. When we feel that, we act in response to that. It is formative. So Paul says, do not be conformed, but be transformed. Now, it's curious when he says don't be conformed, he doesn't give us specific directions on how to do that. But when he comes to transformed, he does give us directions. By the renewing of your mind, he says. By the renewing. In other words, it will make a difference on how you think, 
how you think about life, the world, God, relationships, how you think about the actions in which you engage. If you want to live a life that is moving in the direction of transformation, you will have to have a renewed mind. A renewed mind will cause you to look carefully and thoughtfully to the actions in which you engage to not just simply be by chance, but to truly be by choice. In fact, sometimes that renewing of our minds can help us see the lives we currently live in a different way. I want to read to you the words of a woman named Julie Canlis. Julie Canlis is writing about an experience she had in her Ph.D. program and a conversation she had with Eugene Peterson, the same one whose paraphrase we read a few moments ago. It was a stressed out time. Here's what Candlas writes. She writes it on the Christianity Today website in the section entitled CT Women or Christianity Today Women. She writes, years ago during graduate studies at Regent College, I had a desperate talk with Eugene Peterson about how my PhD had turned the words of God into a great big research project. I was trying to read my lifeless Bible, but I was interrupted a thousand times by children needing to be fed, changed, read to, and more. I begged him to give me a spiritual discipline, some rope to haul me out of the hole I was in. Well, Julie, he said, is there anything you're doing in a disciplined manner already? I thought about my newborn daughter, Iona, and the hours that I spent nailed to our couch feeding her. She had reflux, and most of what went into her immediately came up again, which meant that I had to repeat the feed all over again. Nursing Iona is the only thing I can count on, I said. She makes sure of that. He patted my hand like a parent consoling a dissatisfied child who is not content with their lot in life. Julie? He said, that is your spiritual discipline. Now start paying attention to what you're already doing. Be present. In other words, be present to where the Spirit is in what you're doing. In that moment, and so many others like it, I was weakened by a very common and insidious temptation. I wanted to be for Christ instead of being in Christ. I saw my familial responsibilities as obstacles to a godly life when, in fact, they were the very place where God wanted to meet me. Accordingly, I had to radically revise my view of obedience to include the simple act of abiding in Christ. In other words, with a renewed mind, with a renewed way of seeing and understanding, she realized the most challenging places for me, which are my family, are not an obstacle. I've been viewing those, those actions as obstacles to my formation. They are the context of it. This is where God meets me. Everybody is being formed. Every single one of us. The question is, who or what is forming us? Is it the word or the age? Is it by choice or by chance? And finally, we are formed by the destination we have ahead of us. The journey we're on, where are we headed with it? What do we see as the ultimate outcome? The destination forms us. It guides us. And in this passage, Paul has two destinations in mind for us to look at and consider. They are both possibilities, he says. The first one is transformation. The second one is conformation. I'm underlining that, not to be confused with confirmation. Those are two, two things that lie before us, two options that we have, transformation or confirmation. Those destinations will determine and decide how we live our lives day to day. Now, 
In a sense, those are opposite sides of a similar coin. Listen to what the late, great James Montgomery Boyce, pastor, author, scholar, and preacher, wrote about this passage. Paul says we are to be not conformed but transformed by the renewing of our minds. There is a deliberate distinction between those two words. Conformity is something that happens to you outwardly. Transformation happens inwardly. So they start in different directions and work in different ways. So confirmation, conformation is outward. It's what we do in the attempt to fit in, to not stand out, to assimilate into whatever cultural milieu we find ourselves. There's a term that goes with that that we use many times that we could use instead of that probably, and this is it, peer pressure. We do things by peer pressure just so we don't stand out and, and, and look odd or different or weird. Ruth Berenda, psychologist, some 20 years ago, she and some colleagues of hers did a research project. What they did is they brought 10 teenagers at a time into a room and gave them some explanations about what was going to happen. Now, one of those teenagers didn't know that Brenda and the other psychologists had met with the other nine before outside of the room. So one is there blind, doesn't know what's going on. Bring all 10 of them into the room and says, we're going to draw some lines on this blackboard. They're going to be different lengths. So what we want you to do is as we point at these lines, when we get to the line you believe is the longest line, we want you to raise your hand. Everybody good? Yes, everybody's good. Now, what the one did not know was that outside of the room, the other nine had been told, don't raise your hand on the longest line. Raise your hand on the second longest line. They knew that. The one didn't. And so they ran group after group through their study. When they got to that second longest line, nine hands shot up. The researchers are all watching that one kid who stands there and looks and knows that's not the longest line and who kind of looks around and then time after time, slowly but surely, raises their hand as well. 75% of the time wanted to conform, fit in, which caused Brenda at the end of the study to reflect this way, to say, we found out that most of us would rather be president than be right. Now, don't send me any emails. This, is, this was 20 years ago. It has nothing to do with the current election. I'm not making any statement about that. But Brenda was probably right. We all want to conform. We all want to fit in. Therefore, if this is your destination, the questions that will be asked in your heart of hearts is, is this popular? Will I fit in? Will anyone not like me? Will I be accepted? Those are the kinds of questions that will dominate our formation. And we will be formed to step in the most popular and the most safe directions. But if transformation is our goal, that's a very different reality. Because what drives transformation are questions like these. Is this Christ-like? Does this reflect his love and compassion and grace? Does this reflect his ethic? Is this true? We will be transformed according to that. So that as we live in a transformative way in that fashion, what happens is that the fruit of the Spirit begins to grow in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. To the point that people over time we know well look at us and say, what's going on with you? Something's different here. You're not the person you used to be. That's life transformation. And that's exactly what Paul is calling us to in this passage because of the mercy of God, 11 chapters of God's faithfulness to us. Now one call that will go and be expanded over the next three chapters or so, four chapters, where he's saying based on all of that, now 
Here's what I call you to do. Be formed by the Word. Choose disciplines by choice. Make certain transformation is your destination. I want to invite you to consider three simple challenges. Three things to possibly start to try this week. Here's number one. This week, take some time to sit down with this book. Hard copy, iPad, whatever you want to do. Now, don't start by trying to run a marathon. I'm going to read two hours. I'm going to read the New Testament. Don't do that. And for heaven's sakes, don't start with Leviticus. I mean, you don't, you don't, start, re, you don't start learning math by taking calculus. Start something like, start with Luke, start with Philippians, start with a psalm a day. Don't take long, five minutes, ten minutes, not long, because if you do, you'll fail, you'll be discouraged, and you'll lay it aside. But take some time this week, every day. And when you start, start, say, for example, with Psalm 1. Let this be your prayer, God. Let me see something in this today that will echo in my mind throughout the day, that will be formative in my heart till my eyes close and sleep tonight. Please form me through this word. That's the first invitation. Second invitation, try one new spiritual discipline this week. Just one. There are many spiritual disciplines. Scripture is a spiritual discipline. Sabbath is a spiritual discipline. Maybe try Sabbath in a way you used to and haven't in a long time. Solitude is a discipline. Service is a discipline. Fasting is a discipline. All prayer is a discipline. Try a discipline. Choose one once this week and say, God, if this is an area where I need to grow, please show me as I engage in this spiritual discipline. And then finally, maybe this prayer is worth praying. God, there's a lot within me that wants to be popular, that wants to be liked. Please give me your spirit strength to stand even when it's not popular. Strengthen me against confirmation and focus me on transformation. Three simple challenges. I hope you'll think about them, try them, because I have come to believe that that preacher so many years ago was right. I think that a lot of us are terrified that this is as good as it's going to get. But if you feel that fear, don't settle down in the fear. Take it as an indication that you are not yet all God wants you to be. Take it as a call to life transformation. And just keep responding to his invitation. Follow me and you will move in the right direction. God of grace, thank you for your call on our lives and your transformative power to us. In Jesus' name, amen.